Good morning, Freedom Church. It's so good to be together and to be able to share the gospel. Eh? How blessed are we that we can join together week after week and just lean into God's word as we learn more about him and his ways. Speaking about learning, it feels like God has been taking us on a deeper journey lately. We've been dialing in on the details and there's a sense of growth as we dig deeper and deeper into God's word. Amen. Do you remember Michelle's sharing two weeks ago about the waiting place? And what stood out for me was the very powerful one-liner that said this, God doesn't waste the wait. And she also told us to wait patiently upon the Lord. <laughs> it takes spiritual maturity to wait upon the Lord, right? And to wait patiently takes a miracle. <laughs> oh, And then last week, Dean took us through scripture on the symbolism of water. And he unpacked the importance of baptism in such a practical way. And how special is it that we get to see that in action today? People publicly pointing to Jesus as they follow the example that Jesus set for us. Hey? It's absolutely beautiful. So today we are going to continue on our journey with God as we jump straight into his word. Are you ready? So please turn with me to the very last book in the Bible. So it's a nice and easy one to find. We will be looking at Revelation chapter 2 as our foundation for today's message. And while you find it in your Bible or search for it on your smartphone, I would like to just give you a little bit of context. In the book of Revelation, God is addressing the seven churches, speaking to each of them individually. And in chapter 2, the one that we will be looking at today, the Lord addressed the church of Ephesus, commending them for not giving up and successfully seeking out the false apostles. So they basically ratted them out. But then in verse 4, God is pointing out a bit of a, a grudge or a gripe he has against the church of Ephesus. And this is what he says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. He says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. He's basically saying you've forgotten your first love. Then he says, consider, look how far you have fallen. Repent and do these things that you did at first. What he's basically saying there is turn away and get back to doing the good things that you did in the beginning. You see, friends, the church of Ephesus, they were doing well. They were doing well and everything on the outside was perfect. But on the inside, they had forgotten about God and they drifted off. Well, God warns them to humble themselves and return to their first love. And this is the title of our message today, friends. Return to your first love. Speaking of love, don't you just love a good old statistics? I know I do. So let's look at some stats. And I pray that these stats will encourage you to read and get to know your Bible for yourself so that your life can be transformed. I'm absolutely sure about it because when I went, when, when I was preparing, I went down a bit of a rabbity rabbit hole. And uh, I giggled when Michelle said she also loves a good old rabbit hole. But while I was down in that rabbit hole, I came across a very interesting study. It was a large study done by the Institute for Biblical Research. And what they did is they studied the effect or the impact that the Bible had on people's lives when they actually engage with the Word. Basically asking the question, what changes when I read the Bible for myself? And this is what they found. Someone who reads the Bible once a week, there's almost no effect on them. It makes no difference really. And then someone who reads the Bible two to three times a week, mm, still not much. They say you can see something, but they say it's negligible. It's a big word for an Afrikaans guy like me, hey? <laughs> then there's a massive jump for people who read the Bible four times or more per week. The studies show that if you read your Bible more than four times a week, you are 228% more likely to share your faith with others in public. 
you are 407% more likely to memorize scripture. You are 59% less likely to look at pornography. And at least 30% less likely to struggle with things like loneliness, anxiety, and depression. Those are some solid stats, right? But here's the point I'm trying to make is when the word and not the world becomes the majority in your life, your life will start to change. And I don't know about you, but I think we can all do with some godly change, right? I probably had one of the hardest week in a long time, and if it wasn't for the word and my relationship with God, I don't know where I'd be. James 1.21 says, It's the implanted seed of the word that saves your soul. Isn't that beautiful? Friends, we need God and His Word. And if we don't read the Word and grow in our knowledge of the truth, we will perish under pressure. Hosea 4 verse 6 says, My people perish due to a lack of knowledge. Friends, when the prophet Hosea wrote this, he was calling out the Israelites because they had forgotten God. They had been unfaithful to Him by worshipping idols. So Hosea reminds them that God has not forgotten them, even though they had forgotten about God. Friends, I want us to not be like the Israelites. Make sure that you do not forget about God. Receive the word of God and you will be saved. Reject it and you will perish. Friends, we need to read the word of God. Don't say that you haven't heard from God if your Bible is shut. Don't say that you haven't heard from God if your Bible is shut. And yes, I am aware that God speaks to us through people. He reveals himself to us in nature. But the main way that God speaks to us is through his word. So allow God to speak to you through the power of his word. Don't just rely on the pastor every Sunday. Make a point to spend some alone time with God every day, connecting with Him, specifically reading the Bible. Friends, I say specifically the Bible because so many people nowadays are being discipled by social media instead of the Bible. People are, instead of the Bible, people are watching Instagram reels, YouTube shorts, TikToks, and they listen to podcasts. And I'm not saying that those things are bad. They have their place, but they should not be your primary source or intake on discipleship. You know, it's like living off breadcrumbs when the real food, the full loaf, is sitting there on your bedside table gathering dust. Friends, there will never be a substitute for the Bible. Just like our bodies need wholesome food, our souls are fed through the Bible. You can supplement with media things if you like. And if they line up with God's word, then you will know that they are authentic and that they are to be trusted. But if the Bible is not your primary source, you are going to be spiritually malnourished. You should be reading and digesting the word of God for yourself every day. Does that make sense? Friends, we need to live in obedience to God as we are his bride. And Jesus is the bridegroom in heaven, and he will come back for his bride one day. His heart is completely sold out for us as his bride. Amen? Are you excited and ready for that day when Jesus comes for his bride? I am. Now, speaking of bride and excitement, my wife and I had the privilege of celebrating our 15-year wedding anniversary on the 3rd of October. (laughs) I feel super blessed To have been fortunate enough to marry the love of my youth. And she's also my first love. Can you believe it? But we sat next to each other in our grade 4 class photo at the tender age of 10. And we started dating when we were 17. And already then God had plans for us as a couple. And we weren't even aware of it. eh? Here's a little photo. Have a look at that. Look how cute. eh? But friends, the 22 years we've been together did not come stress-free. We have endured some proper challenges and hardships along the way. 
There were seasons, seasons where we felt closer than ever before. But there was also seasons where we lived independent from one another. We passed each other like ships in the night due to the high demands of life. And it felt like we drifted apart for a while. But despite that, our love has always remained steadfast and strong for one another. Friends, even if your relationships are strong, we all experience seasons of closeness and seasons where we feel distant from others. We all experience the drift from time to time. Sometimes we don't even realize that we have drifted apart, right? Raise your hand if you can relate to this, friends. I don't want to pray. It's not that I'm going to pray for you. I just want to see who's honest in service today. <laughs> oh, but friends, if a ship is not anchored, it will drift off and it could smash into the rocks. If you swim in the sea, be careful not to drift. That's why you need to stay between the flags so you don't drift into the riptide that will sweep you away. Friends, the drift happens between people and it happen the, the drift happens between people and it happens in our relationship with Christ as well. And today we are reflecting on our relationship with Christ. Do you remember that first encounter with him? It feels like you're on cloud nine. And I can imagine Paul must have felt like this on Straight Street. One moment he denies. The next, he delights in the Lord. <laughs> There's this fire, this zeal, and this joy that we, cannot, we can, can't explain, but we experience it due to the delight in our first love for the Lord. A newfound faith that sets your heart on fire. Your mind is set on the things above. You just want to get out there and tell the world that Jesus lives. Everything else becomes second. Everything else becomes less important, and it was an, an awesome place to be. Now, even though Paul got radically saved, I don't think he ever imagined that he was going to face all the challenges and hardships that he did. And the reality is that we all face hardships, and things happen that are beyond our control. And, the, and this feeling of freedom and fire can become a feeling of cold confined confinement. We feel so exposed and our flame sometimes dims as we start to drift, as we start to drift off. Friends, sometimes we drift away from the Lord because the pressure of life gets to us and we get distracted. Other times, the circumstances don't give us enough time, in, enough time to build a relationship with our Father. Maybe it's work shifts, ridiculously long hours, or even perhaps on Sundays you need to work. We are just so consumed by all our responsibilities these days. And over time, our relationship with God grows cold. Just like a coal starts to cool after falling from the fire. A friend of mine says that if you're not burning more for Jesus now than the first day that you met, you are busy backsliding. And I think what he's trying to say is that we don't pursue God enough. And I get that. I get that. But perhaps there's other reasons as well. Maybe one, uh, another reason is, uh, uh, maybe another reason why our love for the Lord fades is because we lose our sense of need for him. After all, when we were down and out, it was our need for God that brought us to him for salvation in the first place, Right? And then as we got back up and we grew stronger and we got on our feet, we tend to forget about Him. We begin to feel self-sufficient and foolishly believe that everything we have gained and achieved was due to our own wisdom and our own abilities and our own efforts. We as humans can be so doff some days. In fact, most days, right? <laughs> humans are so doff. Their birth, some humans are so doff, their, birth, their birthstones, you know what a birthstone is? It's, that, it's the, those precious gemstones that represent your birth month, the month that you were birthed in. Some people are so doff that their birthstone is a brick, is a buckskin. 
<laughs> Do you know why we are so dull, friends? Because we are quick to forget where our help comes from. And we get all puffed up and prideful about what we have achieved. <laughs> we see it all over the world today, friends. The world has become so smart and so self-sufficient. They think they don't need God anymore. They can do everything by themselves. We can now throw seeds in the sky and make our own rain. Well, how did those floods work out for your mates in Dubai? Eh? Yeah. Now, just like Dubai did their own thing, friends. Some of the seven churches that God speaks to in Revelations were also doing their own things. This kind of behavior was nothing new. Is nothing new to God, friends. There was a church in uh, Laodicea, which is the modern day Turkey. They became very successful and they got distracted and they got distracted by their success. They allowed gold and gadgets to choke the life out of the church, making the church unfruitful. They allowed their success and their self-sufficiency to get to their heads, to go up to their heads and they forgot about God. Everything seemed great on the outside, but behind the scenes, things were fraught. Nice Afrikaans word, fraught, eh? Yeah, things were fraught. And then God calls their bluff. So let's read what God said to them in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. It says, I know all the things you do. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. Friends, this is a dangerous place to be. No matter who you are and what you have, you can't fool God. Don't be lukewarm. Don't become arrogant, prideful and self sufficient when i think of these scenarios i can't help but think of these european or first world countries they've become so independent and so self-sufficient and self-righteous in a way let us show you how it's done they have jobs and they have housing and they've got medical care and they've got all these safety and they don't have potholes and all those kind of things and they're so successful and self-sufficient. And when you tell them they need to give their lives to God, they're like, why, why, why would I need God? Because I've got everything I need. See, and as a result, they have lost their dependence and their need for God. But in South Africa, we don't have all these things. And we need God more than ever. But we should make sure that we learn from others' mistakes and remind ourselves not to become independent from God, friends. You can be independent from a lot of things, but never become independent from God. I'm not even sure why America cele celebrates Independence Day. But we should celebrate Dependence Day every day. Our dependence on God, eh? Amen? And we must never become so independent that we are our own solution to our problems, then we are in trouble. If God is our solution, and we need God more than anything, we need to keep it that way. Friends, whether you are successful or not, you should never lose your need for God. Maybe you have turned away from God because He didn't meet your need when you prayed for healing, and that loved one ended up passing away. Friends, I know that we hurt. But we as humans, we fail so often. And God says, come. The Lord never fails. Just return to your first love. Friends, He knew you before you were even formed in your mother's womb. He knitted you together. He knew the challenges that you would face. He knew you were going to fall and make mistakes. He knew that. You see, friends, God is not looking for every opportunity to punish you. He is longing for every opportunity to be with you. He wants you to depend on Him in everything that you do, friends. 
Psalm 37 verse 5 says this. It says, commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust Him and He will help you. Isn't that beautiful? And the good news today is that God is calling you and I to return to our first love. He wants you and I to run back to Him. Just like the prodigal son, the father is on the lookout for his sons and daughters. He welcomes them home with open arms and he celebrates their return. Perhaps you're sitting here today and you're going, okay, okay, I get the point. I need to return to the father. I need to come back to my first love. But how? How do we turn back to him practically? Well, the answer was in the first scripture that we read today. And it basically said this, and I'm going to be paraphrasing, but it said, Church, you have forgotten your first love. Remember your first love and I will, and you will see how far you have fallen. Repent because you have fallen and return to your first love. So we should return to our first love by remembering. So our first R today is remember. Now what do we need to remember? We need to remember the sacrifice Jesus made for your salvation. Because of him, we can be in relationship with God. So remember how you felt about God and your first love for him. With people, it's remembering that butterfly feeling in your tummy, right? That kind of moment. I remember, well, Swayze and I, we like to watch our DVD, our wedding DVD from time to time. And as we watch our wedding DVD, we reflect and we remember how special the day was and those sacred vows we made before God and one another. But when we watch it, as a husband, it helps me to remember and reflect about those vows. And then I ask myself, how am I holding up to these promises that I made before God? Do I still have the same sense of love and care for my wife like I did at first? Well, the answer is no. It's not the same. It's much stronger. In the same way, friends, we must ask ourselves, do I still have the same need for God now as back then? In fact, we should need Him more now than what, than what we did then. So point number one is to remember and reflect. Point number two is to repent. Repent and say sorry for getting distracted. And then we need to release the hold that we have on our own lives. Stop trying to control everything and resubmit your life to God. Fully surrender to the Holy Spirit as you repent. This is the turning point, friends. A repentance involves a change of mind, heart, and a change of direction. It's a total 180. Throw away the thoughts, the attitudes, and the actions. That have drawn your te- your attention away from God. I just love how the Amplified Bible speaks of repentance. It has these beautiful explanations in brackets. And the Amplified can explain things so beautifully. And I'm going to read this as if it's one verse. But there are these beautiful explanations in the brackets. So just follow on the board if you can. It's Acts chapter 3 verse 19 and 20. It says, So repent. Change your inner self, your old, change your old way of thinking and regret past sins. And return to God. Seek His purpose for your life so that your sins may be wiped away, completely blotted out and erased. So that, time, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, restoring you like a cool wind on a hot day. This passage is so rich and so beautiful, friends. We could spend days just going deeper and deeper onto that. But what it's basically saying is that we need to repent and return to God and we will be refreshed and fully restored. That's point number two. So point number three is return. The prophet Isaiah tells us to return to first to the first works. So what he's basically saying is that we need to return to doing the things that we love doing when we first came to faith. Go back to the basics. And friends, you don't need to overthink this. The first works are often basic things like prayer, fasting, studying the Bible, reflecting on God, giving, maybe serving. Whatever it is that you did in the beginning, it says go back to that, the things that you love doing. And then the word works 
All this means is that actual effort is required. Returning to your first love doesn't happen without effort on your part. Love is not just a feeling, friends. Love is best expressed through our actions. So don't just say that you're returning to your first love. Show that you mean it through your actions. Because the Bible also says faith without deeds is dead, right? So as we start to wrap up, let's recap. We need to remember. Yeah, in order to return to our first love, we need to remember, repent, and return. And when we do these things, the Lord says that He will refresh us like a cool wind on a hot day. And with that refreshed spirit, God instructs us to put our love into action. We're not just ticking the boxes because we want to perform, right? Instead, we serve and realize that we need Him, that we need God, and that we can't do anything without God. I would like to end off with one last scripture from the book of John, chapter 15, verse 5. It says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Friends, we can do nothing without the help of the Lord. We need Him in and for everything we do. In closing, if I had to sum up today's whole sermon, because I know I've said a lot, but if I had to sum up today's sermon into one sentence, it would be this. If we really love God, we will be quick to remember, repent and return to our first love. And the Lord will restore and refresh our spirit as we remain in Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen.